been on quite a long journey and uh, many of you were there yesterday uh, but we're going to ramble on from the point we got to however I will briefly recapitulate because otherwise you'll be completely lost so we're looking at a, uh, a chain of conditions uh, a chain of causal uh, conditions which lead ultimately to disharmony, violence, um, disunity, and so on. And this is dedicated to the Russian Revolution. Um, so, of course, we're not looking at it in terms of uh, 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 historical uh, materialism or anything like that. We're looking at it in terms of processes that begin in immediate experience. And we're seeing how those unfold into attitudes and views, uh, opinions, theories, which lead us into conflict. And this happens at the microcosmic level of the individual. Each of us produces our own uh, complex of views and attitudes which lead to conflict. And we're also caught up in larger social forces, cultural attitudes, and of course ones which we even buy into, that we commit ourselves to. But it all begins simply with direct experience, the direct experience of uh, sensation, uh, sensation of the, the, which is the, the, the reaching out of the, the sense organs to the sense object, or you could say the sense object reaching out to the sense organ in consciousness. That's sensation. We were exploring that just now in meditation. It's that immediate sense of contact of uh, foot with ground before there's any hedonic response, any feeling of pleasure or pain connected with it. So it begins there. The senses open up to the world around and they take in information, you could say, to put it rather blandly. Uh, of course, why they do that is another question which we'll hopefully see in a moment. Those sensations, at this point, completely neutral, it's almost, you might say, mechanical, biological, uh, they lead to some response of pleasure or pain, or not much of either. Um, every sensation has some element of what in Pali and Sanskrit is called Vedana, uh, for which we have no real English equivalent unfortunately, because it's quite a, a useful distinction. As I said yesterday, what we mean by that immediate hedonic sensation uh, is not really covered by the word feeling, because feeling spreads from sensation through to emotion. Um, there's no word we have for it, so we're just going to have to get accustomed to Vedana. Um, hedonic sensation is, sounds rather grand for what is something immediate and, and felt, uh, pleasant, neutral, or painful. When, it's, when, when we say neutral, it's really that the stimulus is very low. So there's no real, uh, even noticeable, uh, hedonic response, if you see what I mean. A lot of our sensations don't register. Although, if you pay attention to them, there will be some uh, pleasure or pain connected with them. As you could see when we were doing that exercise, even just sensing your foot on the ground... I experienced it as quite pleasurable, actually, but it might not be. It might be the opposite. So uh, sensation always gives rise to Vedana, always gives rise to a feeling response, a hedonic response. It's quite important for Buddhist uh, practice. Every sensation has some tinge of uh, pleasure or pain. Uh, of course, um, pleasure uh, gives rise to... Well, pleasure is pleasurable, and we want more of it. We want it to continue. Uh, we want to have it again. Uh, so uh, we need to sort of understand how it comes about, what causes it, and how we might go about getting it. Uh, we need to interpret what's going on when we have pleasurable sensation so that we can uh, uh, increase it and, and continue it. 
The same goes for painful sensation, if anything more so. When we have painful sensation, we really want to understand what's involved and uh, so that we can get rid of it and avoid it in the future. We need to find out what causes it, who's to blame, that's often the way we think, who's responsible for it, and what we can do to remove it. So we start to interpret. This is covered by this uh, uh, Sanskrit word here, samnya, uh, sanya in Pali, for those of you who know Pali, um, which again has no really proper translation. It's uh, interpretation. It's first of all the labeling of our experience so that we're able to name the elements of it. We're able to say floor, ceiling, um, table, chair, arm, hand, etc. Pain, pleasure. We're able to make these sort of discriminations um, which are not inherent in the raw experience. The raw experience is, as it were, mute. It has no labels connected with it. It just arrives, comes out of the, just the, the process of conditioned arising, the undifferentiated flow of, uh, of experience. But we stand a little bit back from that experience and we label it, which means, of course, we identify elements within experience and cut them off from the flow, if you see what I mean. So everything is really undifferentiated. You know, we, let's just take a simple thing like a body. Uh, body is, is it, it, in a sense, unitary. But we differentiate, we isolate hand from arm, from shoulder and so on. So we cut our experience up into manageable units that allow us to understand it. We're going to come back to why we want to understand it, but here I'll give you a, a, a very heavy-handed hint. We do it for our own benefit, obviously. We do it so that we can survive and thrive. So we interpret our world uh, by labelling it, and uh, then once we form these labels, once we formed concepts uh, which go with the labels or which the labels... Uh, relate to, we begin to relate those concepts, those words to each other in patterns of thinking, uh, usually aspiring to be logical, often not very logical, but we think they are. We're very convinced by our own reasoning, but often it doesn't bear very close examination because it's quite strongly contaminated by um, previous patterns, which we'll come back into later. So we start thinking. Vitarka is the, uh, the, Pali, the Sanskrit word. Vitaka is the Pali. Um, we start arranging concepts together in patterns that allow us to understand what's happened, why we're suffering, uh, why we've got play, pe pleasure, how that arises, what the, the conditions are in dependence upon which it's arising, and how we can perpetuate it if it's pleasurable and avoid it if it's painful depending on your tastes of course uh, so you um, uh, you uh, uh, you form the beginnings of as it were an interpretive theory a little bit of a framework or you set out on the path of trying to understand what's going on um, because it doesn't come with a label on it saying what it is. It doesn't come with an explanation built into it. Uh, the explanation is not present in the experience itself, if you see what I mean. We have to arrive at an explanation by abstracting ourselves from the flow of experience, forming concepts through which we can grasp experience. Huh? Very important process. Very important to recognize that process going on. So what's especially important, is of course that you're moving into increasing abstraction. You're moving out of the flow of experience, standing, as it were, somewhat separate from it, uh, and uh, trying to arrive at what presents itself to you as an objective interpretation of experience. Huh? That's the way thinking operates. It presents itself as... Uh, as objective. 
actually it's, it's completely impossible to attain true objectivity. Um, for the philosophers amongst you, go back to the critique of pure reason. This is what Kant really de uh, demonstrated once and for all, I think, to uh, really brush away the rationalism and then the, the uh, scholasticism of, of previous years. He just showed that thinking cannot deliver us a truly objective viewpoint. What Kant said was, the more objective your viewpoint, the less you actually can know through that, if you see what I mean. The more abstract it is, the less it's related to actual experience. But we have to try. We do try. Um, Kant, interestingly, called it uh, it's a regulative principle. You need to be have the aspiration to objectivity because that gives you the possibility of understanding what's going on. However, usually we're not at all sophisticated about this. We're just scrambling to get a hold on what's going on uh, in the fizzing, buzzing uh, chaos of the whole business of being alive. Uh, because, of course, as I've said, experience is delivered to us completely mute. And uh, we're fighting to get some sort of understanding of it so that we can, as organisms and as uh, self-identified uh, beings, um, prosper within it. Uh, prosper and propagate ourselves and perpetuate our pleasure and so on. So thinking is working to deal with what has been delivered to us by the, the more immediate and incontrovertible uh, sensation and Vedana. Do you see what I mean? You can't dispute that you've got a sensation. Uh, a sensation is a sensation is a sensation. The, the pain or pleasure is, is, is not arguable. If somebody says, my toe hurts, you can't really legitimately say to them, no, it doesn't. Um, uh, it's extremely annoying when people do that sort of thing. Um, it either does or it doesn't, if you see what I mean. And by and large, when people make those reports, they, they uh, report honestly. Uh, so at this point, we're dealing with what I call primary reality, a reality uninterpreted, uh, reality unabstracted. When we get to samya, and it's when we get on to thinking, we're getting more remote from experience uh, so that we can handle experience. And uh, insofar as uh, at this stage of the explanation we're, we're thinking of, of this interpretive enterprise as essentially for the purposes of the organism's survival, it's, so to speak, selfish. Uh, the interpretation is in order to get the best benefit for self so that you can prosper at this stage of things. We'll, we'll see why that is and how that comes about in a while. So thinking tries to get a grasp on things, but actually it's extremely difficult to really know what's going on. Actually, it's impossible because what's really going on is so complex, there's so many factors involved. In fact, there are more factors than we can possibly think about, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's uh, any, any interpretive uh, framework we come to is only an approximation, and an approximation from a particular starting point for a particular purpose. And uh, um, a lot of the time, it's rough and ready, and it sort of works. Uh, we manage to just jog along with interpretations that more or less do. Some of them are pretty accurate because they're quite closely um, verified in experience. Um, you know, uh, ow, um, pain, uh, what's that? Feels like I'm burning. I'm sitting in the fire. Um, and that's a pretty good interpretation and the uh, the the, uh, the the policy that arises from that you know that the the whole committee uh, agrees with is to get out of the fire um, so uh, a lot of our interpretation is is just quite low level uh, it's just dealing as it were almost empirically with what's going on having a sensation standing back from it interpreting the sensation acting appropriately in relation to it because we can uh, we can verify what's going on but of course it gets much more difficult 
It gets much more difficult, especially where those other wretched human beings are concerned. You know what I mean. Um, they're not like a simple fire that you can just say, that burnt. Uh, uh, when we come into interaction with other minds, and especially when we come into interaction with other minds in much more complex circumstances of, of a modern uh, civilization, it's much more difficult to know what's going on. And um, uh, when we come into painful interaction with others, uh, or when we come into interaction with others where we anticipate some pleasure from them, but we don't know whether they're going to want that too, um, if you see what I mean, um, the thinking starts to go out of control. It goes uh, uh, a bit sort of wild. In the, in the, the term that's used in, in Pali, is, uh, in Sanskrit, is prapancha, papancha in Pali. And it's, it's uh, etymologically, they say, I don't know whether this is true, connected with punch, which means five. And it's said to be like a hand uh, with the fingers spreading out. So the thinking spreads out. And uh, the less you're able to immediately verify your theory in empirical experience, the more you're likely to start spinning ideas out. And uh, uh, that can get really pretty wild. If I'm sure I'm not the only one who's experienced this. And uh, as I said yesterday, anybody who's done any meditation will probably know of this, uh, this experience where somebody said something to you earlier in the day, or it can be much more serious than that, maybe far back in your life, and you're just unable to do anything but try to get hold of it, to grasp it. Because what thinking does is enable you to control, or at least have the illusion of control of your environment. Because you're able to explain what's happening, and thereby to feel some sense of, uh, of agency. You've, you've got what's going on, so you feel some sort of uh, sense of being on top of it. Um, of course, I'm only dealing now with, as it were, the out-of-control element of this. There's a very positive way in which this can come about as well. But uh, this propuncia spreads out, and uh, if the, the more deep it is uh, in your life, uh, the more it's connected with other issues in your life, the, the, the more the propuncia spreads out, and the more gets tangled up in the attempt to find a satisfying overall uh, theory that explains. And uh, it eventuates in what is in the, in the sutta that we're dealing with called Prapancha Samya Sankha. Um, just to, I won't uh, parse that again. But it means a, uh, a, a, a spreading out that arrives at a sort of summary, a summation that forms a total complex interpretive framework. Um, there's a sort of clunk. Everything fits into place. Um, the, the sort of thing that I, I mean um, is where somebody's offended you in some way, you felt quite upset by what somebody's said to you, and uh, you, you don't really understand what's going on, and your mind goes a bit out of control, so you're sitting in your meditation or just walking down the street or you're sitting doing what you're doing but the back of your mind is trying to work it out and uh, you're pulling in all sorts of different ideas and theories you're pulling them in from your own earlier experience you're pulling them in also from uh, uh, views and philosophies and uh, uh, pop psychology or whatever all the bits and pieces that lie around you and then you arrive at, I know what it was, uh, they've got it in for me because I'm this or that or the other. Um, in, you know, you, you can choose your own poison where this is concerned. We've all got our own victim slots, as it were. So that would be one way in which that might turn out, uh, that one finds a, a, a framework that allows you to feel you've understood what's going on and because you've understood what's going on, and of course you may not be completely inaccurate by any means, 
But that's not quite the point here. It's, it's more emotional than that. Once you've arrived at that total picture of what's going on, there's a, a strange sense of satisfaction, even if there's nothing you can do, even if you're powerless in the face of, of what's going on. You feel some sense of sort of superiority, some sense of control. Uh, and of course, what happens if that process is not um, um, carried through in a much more conscious way, and we'll look at how we do that later, uh, probably tomorrow, um, so you'll be just left propunchizing today. Um, what happens if you don't uh, ground it in experience and uh, uh, check it through clear thinking, uh, what happens is that you arrive at a theory about your experience, about the, the probably the painful experience that you've had, uh, or even the, pain, the pleasant experience that you've had, which inevitably brings you into conflict with somebody else. Uh, well, not inevitably, but, but very often leads you into, into conflict with somebody else. When these become uh, giant social theories, um, uh, they inevitably lead to, to a conflict with others. Um, so, you know, when, when you're dealing with uh, group identity, whether it's national identity or class identity or race identity or caste identity, whatever it is, or gender identity, when you're dealing with those and you have a grand theory that explains the others, as it were, and why the others behave in a certain way towards you, then you come into conflict. Because they, for their part, poor dears, poor deluded dears, they have their own prapancha samnya samkar. They've got their own interpretive frameworks that explain you and your behavior. Um, so on the macrocosmic scale, it leads to um, geopolitical disaster. Um, uh, and uh, on, the, on the social scale, it leads to inattention and uh, disharmony within, with any particular society or culture. And on the, the more microcosmic or more personal scale, it leads to your difficulties with particular individuals. So the, the prapancha samya sankar is uh, uh, the, the formation of a, an attitude which is as much uh, desiderative, uh, emotional, and volitional as it is cognitive. There's a, a theory if you like, there's a, a set of thoughts by which I do not mean necessarily a very logically coherent one. But there are thoughts that are bundled together in a sort of loose box, um, often even self-contradictory sometimes, um, but which are associated with strong feelings, because at the back of it, of course, there's, there's pain and pleasure, and not just this particular instant of pleasure or pain, but the whole history of it, if you see what I mean. Uh, which leads then to this, uh, this, these attitudes that we carry into our experience. And that new experience is then filtered through uh, and is fitted into. There you are. That's, that's us. Um, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, what we really have to try to deal with. We have to stop this process from spinning out of control. So what the Buddha says, if you remember in that first statement, those of you who were here yesterday, when he's confronted by the rather aggressive wanderer from another sect, is that I, my teaching, uh, uh, I teach a doctrine that does not lead to quarrels and conflict. So the Buddha's approach does not lead to prapancha samya sankar. And of course, uh, we know from the commentary which gives the background to it, that Dandapani, stick in hand, who was the, uh, the other wanderer, uh, came from a sect that was very quarrelsome and that picked sort of intellectual debates and discussions and so forth. Um, so the Buddha's teaching does not lead down this alleyway. It doesn't, it takes us away from this tendency to form a, a, a total cognitive, desiderative, uh, volitional 
pattern, emotional, uh, 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 emotional thinking, uh, desiring pattern, all bundled up together, often as a sort of mass, um, and sometimes extremely inarticulate. Uh, it doesn't lead to that. For the time being, we're going to have to just stick with this a bit longer because I need to fill in a few more bits. It's more difficult than uh, you might think. Uh, you might think it's difficult enough as it is, but I'm going to complicate it yet further and make it more horrific yet um, so that I can tomorrow brilliantly resolve everything and uh, um, show you how wonderful I am. Um, or how wonderful the Buddha is, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, you've got the pattern. Uh, and it's important to realise this, uh, this summation, which you might also say that Prapancha Samya Sankha corresponds to uh, uh, an, another Buddhist term, which is a view, or a drishti, which we'll see a bit further in a moment, is pretty much the same, I think. Um, uh, these views that underlie uh, most of our behaviour, that drive our choices and uh, lead us to do what we do and lead us into the difficulties that we get into, uh, most of them we are completely unconscious of. We don't know where they've come from. We've not actually sort of thought them out, as it were. Some we've just inherited. They're the attitudes that, that go with our society. Um, uh, you know, I've seen in my relatively long, my relatively short, long life, um, I've seen a huge shift in attitudes in, in, in Britain. Um, you know, for instance, racial attitudes. Uh, huge shift. Um, uh, you know, generally in a positive direction. Um, but, you know, if you're born in Britain in the, in, the, in, in, in the 1940s, when I was born, those attitudes were just there. Uh, and attitudes in all sorts of areas. Attitudes to French people, for instance. Um, just to start over the water, as it were. Um, um, joking apart. Uh, but, you, you know, attitudes to other people, other races, other, other, other nations, uh, and, and so on. You know, Irish jokes just sort of naturally, sorry, um, <laughs> the Irish in the room, but, you know, they're just sort of the paddy jokes, uh, which carry, of course, uh, underlying attitudes and so forth, which go way back uh, and so on. All of these were just there. You just got them. And, um, uh, you know, I've seen it in India. I've seen that um, perfectly decent people from upper caste backgrounds, they're not really aware of the uh, attitudes they have to people from so-called lower castes. They're just completely unthinking. Oh, they are like this. Oh, they are like that. And these are not bad people. They're nice people. They're, they're kind to their husbands and wives, and they're, they're good to their children, and they're you know, relatively polite and friendly. But they carry these attitudes because they're around. They just pick them up. And uh, they're never challenged, generally speaking. Because of the, the, the huge change in demographics, most of us have had to face uh, 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 changed um, uh, uh, the, the attitudes that we might unconsciously carry to some degree. Perhaps we need to face them more uh, in all sorts of areas. Uh, so when we talk about view, when we talk about Prapancha Samya Sankha, I've detailed a rather sort of, uh, well, I've, I've detailed in a, um, I've described a process, but that process isn't necessarily one you know is going on. It's very often uh, just a sort of nagging background feeling uh, of, of discomfort and pain and stray thoughts sort of breaking to the surface and so on. Uh, very seldom is it really worked out. The more sophisticated, and I don't mean necessarily sophisticated in a good sense, are likely to provide a much quicker rational explanation of what's going on, even though what's really going on is not actually what they think is going on. So we need to examine a bit more closely what's going on, because the Buddha says what you need to go do is come back to here. You need to come back to Samya. That's where it starts to spin off. 
that's where it starts to go wrong. And actually, that's where the solution lies. If you can get this right, then you can begin to uh, uh, stop this happening. And unfortunately, the sort of pressure for it to happen is very strong. The impulsion is very strong because of the, the problem that pain causes us. And of course, the bigger and the, the deeper the pain is, uh, the more complex the pain is, the more difficult it is to root out what's going on. So we need to look a little bit more closely at Samnya. Um, yesterday I, I did talk about Samnya a bit, and I'm going to recapitulate because it's so important to get this clear. Um, Samnya uh, is in its, at its roots uh, the most basic, if you like, primitive sensory discrimination uh, that even any organism engages in. So any organism, which is uh, um, a set of processes that are organized um, into an identity for survival, if you see what I mean. Uh, so the organism strives to persist in its own being. Uh, it wants to continue and it wants to be, well, at least be at pleasure, uh, whatever that means if you're an amoeba. Um, but uh, in order to do that, the organism has to have a relationship with the world around it that allows it to uh, prosper, to choose what will benefit it and to avoid what will uh, threaten it, what will, will cause it harm. That's what we call senses. The senses are the, the process by which uh, an organism gains the information it requires in order to avoid harm and benefit uh, and move towards what benefits it. That's at the root of all our conceptualization. All our sophisticated thinking has at its root this discrimination of uh, threat from uh, a benefit, if you see what I mean. Uh, and we're, of course, with all sorts of more and more sophisticated shades and distinctions. Um, in the in the animal realm, in the in the in the organic realm, it leads to, uh, of course, the great complexity that you find amongst some organisms. Uh, uh, we all, because they look roughly like us, think of the chimpanzees as the highest. But somebody was telling me the other day that octopuses are pretty smart. Um, apparently, a serious study has shown that octopuses are actually highly intelligent, but their, their intelligence is organized in a very different way. It's not so unitary, it's distributed through all the different parts of the organism. Actually, so is ours, but it tends to be more organized around a central point. So, uh, you know, you, you get uh, more and more complex uh, nervous system, um, which... Uh, and uh, brain that allows for the processing uh, of increasingly complex discriminations. At a certain point, uh, what happens is that the organism begins to be able to identify itself. Maybe even quite early on that happens to some degree, but at the point probably which we can most easily identify through language uh, and conceptualization that uh, is the uh, uh, the, the, the sort of dim abstract dimension of, of language, uh, we begin to be able to identify ourselves because we're able to say I and to think of, uh, of uh, ourselves as enduring um, continuity from the past and having a possible continuity in the, pre in the future. And uh, equal with that, uh, equal and opposite with that, we're able to identify what, we, what appear to us as enduring entities outside us. We uh, identify a jug which, to which we uh, as ascribe a certain uh, enduring identity. Do you see what I mean? The jug is actually uh, just a, a, you know, to, well, just a, you, you could say, you could think of it as a cloud of energy that is, is constantly shifting and changing, but we can't deal with that. We can't get water out of that. So we apply the concept jug. We, we have the concept jug, and then we apply it to a particular ex example, this jug. Um, so we, we build a picture of, of the world, 
which we, to which we apply labels, which allow us to learn, because next time I, I need a drink of water, I'll go and look for a jug like that one, if you see what I mean. I've abstracted from the particular jug a, a, an abstract concept of juggy, jugginess, juggyhood, and I go looking for a particular example that will enable me to, to get what I need. So concepts and the, the language through which concepts are mediated allow us uh, to, um, to carry our experience with us. Um, when you don't have that conceptualizing, your ability to, uh, to carry experience with you is limited to instinct, which can be very, very sophisticated. I mean, you can, you know, the swallows come and nest in my barn, and it's the same ones, apparently. The house martins come back to the same nests every year. How the devil do they do it? They go down to the, uh, the below the Sahel, and then they, they come back again, and they come to the same place. Eels. I mustn't get going on this, but <laughs> eels, <laughs> um, uh, you know, come from the Sargasso sea, it's tr sea. They make straight for the little stream that runs through, through my house and up into the mountain, and they, they, they spawn there. And then they go, the, 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 the elvelings go out and come back again. Anyway, very sophisticated, uh, but it's instinctual. Presumably they don't have a, a sort of map and an, an idea, I must go home, uh, etc. you know, a GPS. They may have, a, well, uh, birds are said to have a sort of, uh, they, they now think there's magnetic, anyway, never mind. Uh, um, so samya becomes extremely sophisticated way of abstracting from the world and breaking it up into intelligible uh, concepts which allow us to handle the world. Um, and that then leads to uh, thinking, which is, if you like, a, a, a more ongoing process of samya, where we're arranging those concepts into logical formations or pseudo-logical formations and arriving ultimately at a perspective. So what's going on in samya? Or rather, what is it that we have to do in order to stop samya from spinning out of control? What the Buddha says in the sutta is that uh, as well as the, the background of uh, sparsha or sensation and vedana leading to samya, the interpretation of what's going on, something else comes in at this point, which is uh, um, from previous conditioning. It's, it's buried deep within us. And uh, what, that, what it's referred to as, and I don't have proper room for this, well, I have to put it up here. Um, informing samya, informing our interpretation, are what are known as anu, anushaya, uh, or anusaya, which means latent tendencies, habitual tendencies, uh, habitual ways of interpreting. Um, fundamentally what it means is egoistic. Fundamentally what it means is uh, uh, in ways of interpreting which are to do with I, with keeping me going. So there's a list given which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you into uh, and I'll explain a little bit further what they mean. The first is uh, simply craving that familiar beast craving then of course there's hatred um, I have to write it down then there's views then doubt the, oh, yeah, then, then conceit ah oh, this one's difficult um uh, attachment to existence. <laughs> to being. And finally, ignorance. So, um, we'll go through these in a little bit more detail. But what do they represent as a whole? Um, 
Remember, what we're trying to do is deal with a problem, the problem of pleasure or pain. Ple pleasure is a problem because you want more of it, if you see what I mean. So you, you need to understand how it happens and what to do about it and how to get more. So it's a problem in that sense, and you don't want to lose it. Uh, pain is a problem because pain is painful, and you want to escape it. So... Uh, when you begin the, the when you begin to move from the the feeling to the interpretation, uh, you bring into play various strategies, various strategies for understanding what's going on. Um, and these are the strategies, the strategies that underlie your interpretation, that drive your interpretation. So the first strategy is craving. And this is particularly, of course, related to uh, pleasurable experience, uh, pleasurable Vedana. Uh, you want more of it, so you long for more of it. That then drives your interpretation. Your solution to the problem of pleasure, the problem that it may cease, is to crave more of it. Yeah, you see? So you're driven to find a way to get more of it. Uh, the response to to pain, put very simply, is uh, is dislike, is hatred. You don't like it, and uh, you, so to speak, don't like what causes it. But especially if the other person, another person, is the cause of it, or seems to be the cause of it, uh, then you you dislike them. Um, these are the kind of primary strategies that we have for dealing with our experience, hatred and craving. Views this is a bit more complex because, of course, we've got views here, really. Uh, uh, but what if, uh, we've got to put this very simply because we don't have time to go into it very thoroughly today. Uh, if you're coming to the, the Monday class, eventually you'll, you'll look at views as one of the uh, 51 mental events. But uh, views, drishti, uh, drishti, which literally means vision or perspective, um, means the, the inclination to find an explanation, if you see what I mean. An explanation, a way of explaining what's going on. A way of explaining it that is uh, abstracted uh, and that uh, gives you a sense that you understand. So it's the craving for explanation, what somebody's called the mania for explanation. Uh, and uh, actually, it's very powerful in us. Uh, I think this is underestimated, the power of view as an anusaya, as an underlying tendency. Um, you remember that, that uh, oft quoted uh, Keats writes to his brother about um, what he calls negative capability, which he says is essential for poetry, which is the ability to, I can't remember the quote exactly, but the ability to uh, remain uh, in uncertainty, the ability to remain without ex ex explaining, without closing down. View is that irritable questing after solution, irritable questing after an explanation that makes you feel you've understood, you've grasped it, you've got it. So it's a strong, powerful impulsion, deeply rooted within us. It's not just to do with having a philosophical bent. Um, it's, it's something that every human being is strongly inclined to, finding a, 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 an answer. Doubt, um, it's not doubt in the ordinary sense of uh, not being sure, not having adequate evidence, if only it were that. Uh, if only people were more doubtful in that sense, recognising they don't actually have the evidence for the theories that they come up with. Uh, doubt here is more of an emotional uh, disposition, a, a reluctance to come to a conclusion, a reluctance to uh, really sort it out, a reluctance to do what needs to be done. In Sagaraksha's term, it's a reluctance to commit yourself to a course of action. And of course, some people are congenitally inclined to this. Um, some people are congenitally inclined not to do it can't bear doubt personally, um, which is a problem. Um, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> conceit, 
here is um, the basic idea that I am wonderful, which, of course, in my case is absolutely true. Um, um, but it's, it's the idea that you are number one, the idea that the universe is fundamentally arranged around me, sometimes around me in a, an extremely annoying way. Uh, you know, I am uniquely the object of the world's malice. Um, but it's a form of conceit, actually, to believe that you are somehow the victim of life. Um, it's as much a conceit as to think that you're the, you know, the, the number one. But it is the, the fundamental belief that the world revolves around you and that the sun shines from somewhere in your anatomy. Um, so conceit is a, a very strong, very deep uh, uh, attachment to self. Um, uh, it, it's in, an, in another Abhidhamma system. Uh, it's uh, spoken of as an inborn uh, uh, defilement, something that you come into life with, a very strong sense that I am important, uniquely important. And it goes with a very strong sense that I am absolutely adorable uh, to myself. Even if sometimes that adorableness is perverted into a sort of uniquely objectionable. Um, we go a bit deeper now. Attachment to being is a, a very strong inclination to be in a state, to have an identity, uh, to be something, to be somebody, to be somewhere, and so on. It's the sort of thing you experience... Um, for instance, when uh, you, you experience loss, uh, say when you lose your job or even when you retire. Uh, I remember uh, I was uh, chairman of this centre for some years, not very many years. But I remember after I resigned, I did resign, honestly, I wasn't pushed out despite rumours. Um, when, I, when I resigned, I really did resign. Um, this is sort of for a while, sort of not quite sure who I was. I'd got myself identified with being Chem. None of Archer won't do this. Um, not at all. <laughs> um, but you can become identified with job, with position, with status, and so on. And that's a little bit of what this attachment to being is. It actually goes much deeper than that. In fact, in, in Buddhist uh, theory, it goes down to attachment to a human body. So that in, in, uh, in the theory of rebirth, what drives you back into life is your longing for a new identity, to be a body in a life somewhere, somewhere, some, somehow, if you see what I mean, at some time. Uh, so this attachment to, to being, uh, bhavaraga, uh, is very, very deep. It's... it's much more fundamental than any of these that we're talking about. You can, you can even largely eliminate these, at least at, at, uh, at upper levels, but you're still li left with this attachment to being. So even if you've got no attachment to human existence, well, you're still attached to uh, a much more subtle, refined, um, uh, in, 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 those of you who understand this, rupa loka or arupa loka existence. Uh, which is the last thing that goes before complete liberation. Um, and then finally, there's ignorance, which is the biggie. Uh, this is your uh, fundamental lack of understanding of the true nature of things. Your belief that there really is a solid me uh, standing behind my experience, having experience, and that there really is... Uh, a world that stands independent of my uh, objective experience. Um, I'm not, therefore, preaching solipsism, please, but it's much more sophisticated than that. But uh, ignorance is a, a fundamental misinterpretation of the nature of, of, of existence, the nature of experience, which, of course, is the deepest of all. So all of that is there Every time we open our eyes, it's so horrible, isn't it? Every time you open your eyes and uh, take in the world around you, s some combination of these is, is coming into play. 
Um, some of them are much more to do with your character and disposition and there's particular circumstances according to Buddhist uh, uh, um, typology. Some people are craving types. Uh, they, they deal with the, with the world mainly by trying to get more pleasurable experience. Trump, some people are hate types. They, try to, they, they, they face life mainly by trying to uh, destroy and eliminate uh, on one level or another. I think it's broadly true. Everybody does everything, but you're a bit predisposed. Some people, when they come into situations, their immediate instinct is to fight. Yeah, I'm one of them. Uh, some people, when uh, uh, they come into a situation, uh, their instinct is immediately to find out where the fridge is. Um, uh, uh, so th some of these are more sort of to do with your particular character and disposition. We've all got those strategies um, at hand, but we tend to favour some strategies more than others. The strategy of views is very, very, um, is, is common. Everybody has that disposition to explain, to arrive at a, an explanatory um, picture, uh, which if it's not done properly comes here. Uh, doubt is, again, a bit more um, uh, um, <coughs> particular. You know, I don't particularly do doubt. Probably better if I did it more often. Um, but uh, some people are congenitally uh, 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 doubting. They don't know what to do but in most situations, if you see what I mean. And you're going to be one or other of these, so don't laugh at the others. Um, <laughs> conceit is common to us all. Uh, where all of us really do believe that uh, we are uh, at the centre of the universe. That's the way it presents itself to us, because as an organism... Uh, that's, uh, the, the, you know, we're organised to keep this particular uh, complex organism alive. So you have to have a fundamental belief in it, if you like, its importance. Attachment to being is very deep within us, this, this desire to find a status, to find an identity, to find a being, and of course, most fundamentally, ignorance is there. All of this is, uh, according to Buddhist theory, uh, inherited from past lives. So we, we've been doing this since beginningless time, according to Buddhist way of approaching it. So in past lives, we've been doing all these things, so they're sort of charged up, if you see what I mean. The, the energy is already there, and it, uh, it comes into this life with us. If you don't like that explanation, then you can take a more evolutionary one. And actually, I don't think the two are in opposition that um, you know, the organism, and we are an organism, has in its background this struggle for survival and the whole evolutionary urge to uh, persist as an organism. But yes, this, these, these anushayas, according to Buddhism, we bring with us, and uh, they are the, the strategies that we bring into play uh, in various combinations uh, when we encounter experience, moment by moment, in each new experience, we call upon, or rather we are called upon, by a whole set of latent tendencies, underlying, unconscious, bred in uh, dispositions. Um, and uh, that's what we've got to try to unpick. This is what the Buddha is saying in his first statement to Dandapani. Uh, we've got to try to make sure that uh, these dispositions do not drive our interpretation and that they do not lead us to uh, interpretations that are more and more out of key with reality and bring us more and more into conflict with reality. Because you, it's conflict is not just a matter of being in conflict with other people. If you have expectations of any kind, you're in conflict with reality. If you have an expectation of health, you're in conflict with reality. If you have an expectation that you're going to live forever, you're in conflict with reality. If you have an expectation that you will always have pleasure, you're in conflict with reality. So we're in conflict in, in very deep ways, as, in, as well as in much more pertinent or much more uh, powerfully of, of effective ways in relation to other people. 
And it all comes from our, our wrong, uh, our, the, the latent tendencies that express themselves through samya and that then guide our thinking, uh, uh, lead to this out of control, uh, uh, reaching for more and more uh, theoretical backing uh, and ultimately to a, a, a total um, picture, cognitive, emotional uh, complex, which through which we then interpret the world, which then, of course, leads us over our lives to set up certain karmic patterns, certain karmic currents, and a certain disposition, which then eventuates in a new life in these latent tendencies, which then emerge moment by moment by moment in our immediate experience. So I've, uh, I've painted a, a, the, the bleakest possible picture, um, and I promise you that tomorrow I will solve the problem, and you'll all be released from your suffering, <laughs> at least theoretically. Um, uh, but it is... Um, Yes, it's rather uh, not a grim picture, but it's, it's a very realistic picture. And what it tells us is how deep the problem lies, how deep we have to go. Of course, we work our way down to it. Uh, we don't get right down into this in a day. You can start to deal with hatred and craving fairly early on um, through ethics. And you can just gradually work your way back down. And we'll see how we do that tomorrow. So don't miss it. Otherwise, you will be trapped in perpetual motion. Thank you.